Thank you to the patrons for supporting the channel. It's a vicious cycle, you know. But then most things in life are. The pendulum swings one way, then it swings the other. Now we return to darkness. Something terrible is coming. Welcome back. Today we're diving back into FNAF World, this time update 2. Before we get into that though, I want to talk about the reaction to my last video, my FNAF Lost Media video. You know that trailer I was talking about remembering? You guys found it. All the sounds, I don't like them. Perfect! No! Oh yeah! Ah! Fucking fuck! You guys were practically begging me to play this again, and I'm glad you agree that this is probably one of the scariest games I have ever played. I really appreciate all of the people who spent their time looking for this and the people who actually found it, and it was just a really cool show of community for the channel. Anyway, moving on. Alright, FNAF World Update 2. If you didn't think things could get even weirder, you're about to be proven wrong. I want to bring up some background though, uh, for Update 2 and just for the game before its initial release. Scott Cawthon was not originally a horror game developer. He was an RPG developer, and he's been making games for a long time. Since 1995, with the game Floppy Disk, he made a whole series called RPG Max, Dinostria, and the Legacy of Flan games, including a multiplayer Legacy of Flan and the online MMORPG Flanville. I could keep going forever, he has made so many games before FNAF. But let's just say, FNAF World was not a new venture for Scott. With that in mind, let's move on. I want to mention that after the first FNAF World teasers were done, there was a new site that was created called FNAFWorld.com. This will be important as we move on to other retrospective series, so keep that in mind. For teasers, it was pretty simple, with the exception of one. Update 2, coming soon. The additions of the FNAF 4 Halloween characters, and in the corner, Foxy, JJ, and Chica in airplanes in the background. Then, on April 1st, Scott Cawthon set a teaser for a new game, FNAF 57, Freddy in Space. Obviously this was just an April Fool's joke, but keep it in mind. Then we were back to the original teaser with new text, 5 13, 16. With the release now set, the stage was set no pun intended. for something new. But as a game, FNAF World Update 2 was in a weird spot. At the time of its release, there was another Scott Cawthon project being teased on scottgames.com, the book had been released, and the movie had been announced. There were tons of other teasers and hints to all sorts of other projects coming around the same time, and so people weren't sure exactly what connected to what, and it wasn't exactly clear how Update 2 was going to come out. We'd just have to wait until release. And strangely, it released on time, May 13th, 2016. So right away you boot up the game and it looks the same. It isn't inherently obvious that something has changed. It's actually really strange how you have to activate the content of this update. Near the spawn area there's a large building. Walking into it will move you presumably inside. Here things are 8-bit and monochrome. And there's kind of a cutscene here, and we'll get into that in the story section, but afterwards you can talk to Fredbear and you are finally released into the new content. So let's talk about it. In this update, they added eight new characters. Nightmarion, Jack O'Bonny, Jack O'Chica, Nightmare Balloon Boy, Anim Dude, Coffee, and Mr. Chipper, and Purple Guy. But the main event for the gameplay were the new minigames that were added to unlock the characters. Let's get right into it. Foxy.exe is a minigame that starts like a desktop where you can open a program called Foxy.exe. This starts a simple game where you walk along a platform as Adventure Bonnie with creepy renders of Withered Foxy in the background as voice lines play over and over. Obviously, this is a play on the EXE creepypastas in subsequent games. At first, you just walk around, but things get harder as you run into Withered Freddy and then later a kitten. To avoid these and move forward, you have to either turn away until they fade or hide behind these black shapes in the foreground. At the end of this minigame, you unlock Nightmarion. Foxy Fighters is a shoot 'em up style scrolling shooter where you control Foxy alongside NPC fighters of Toy Chica, JJ, and Nightmare Chica. 
as you fight waves of enemies finally defeating the final boss, Soldozer, a character from another previous Scott game. Beating the game with a performance of rating B or lower unlocks Jacko Chica, and beating it with an A unlocks Nightmare BB. Then there's Freddy in space, and there you go. Turns out the April Fool's joke wasn't such a joke. This is a Mega Man type side-scrolling shooter where you collect power-ups, shoot enemies, and eventually kill the final boss. Scott Cawthon's head in a jar. If you complete the game normally, only collecting some of the power-ups, then you unlock Jack O'Bonnie. If you complete the game without collecting any power-ups, you unlock Coffee. And if you complete the game collecting all the power-ups, you unlock Purple Guy. And finally, Chica's Magic Rainbow. To any veteran FNAF player, that name will strike absolute fear into your heart. This is a side-scrolling platform that is most reminiscent of old Rage games like Unfair Mario. This game is absurdly difficult with fake outs, random attacks, and an annoying rainbow above you taunting you for every failure. The difficulty is high, the controls are frustrating, obstacles like sunflowers, wooden spikes, logs, and even rainbow laser beams the rainbow itself shoots. You only have 33 lives because after that the rainbow kills you herself and the game ends. Just beating the game normally unlocks Anim Dude, and beating it in under 3 minutes unlocks Mr. Chipper. There were also the new areas that this update took place in. The Halloween backstage is a maze-like biome where a lot of the plot hinges around, and where you run into pretty much all the new characters. There's also the Geist's Lair, a mine-like area with toxic air that drains HP when you're inside. This is where the final boss battle takes place. That's pretty much all the new stuff gameplay-wise. Otherwise, boss battles, character interactions, fights, they're pretty much the same. I think they updated some things like some 8-directional movement and minor bug fixes, but generally that's it. There is more stuff that I haven't talked about yet, but that's not purely gameplay, that's more plot related, so we'll get into that in the plot section. So let's talk about visuals. Again, if you want to know about the game generally, go to my update one video. But for this new update, I do want to talk about a couple things. First, the mini games. Each one has a very specific references and inspirations that are tied to it, not just in the gameplay, but in the visuals. Foxy.exe replicates the old Windows XP era creepypasta with its classic field stock image desktop background that calls directly to the XP default desktop. Then actually playing the game, it's clearly just a sprite from the game ripped and placed into this low budget walking game where you just walk on a plane with a spooky background. While it may be a little on the nose, it does a great job parroting the low quality Sonic EXE ripoffs that spawned and highlights how unscary they are by literally throwing a kitten PNG in as an enemy. Again, maybe a little on the nose, but still pretty spot on as a parody. For other minigames like Foxy Fighters and Freddy in Space, it's clear that these are love letters to other games that Scott Cawthon enjoys. I recall Scott Cawthon saying something about loving the Mega Man games, and that sort of inspiration for the retro space shooter is very clear through these minigames. Obviously, Foxy Fighters is a direct parody of games like Star Fox. Obviously, Foxy would need to be the protagonist for this one with little dialogue screens popping up and the characters talking like little puppets. And Freddy in Space is clearly a love letter to Mega Man and other Metroidvania games. And for Chica's Magic Rainbow, well, obviously the happy-go-lucky visuals contrast with the absolute rage that fills you when playing the game, but there is a bit more than just that. Like other games in the genre, the unfair or rage games, there's this weird use of assets, like the petals on this flower just flying out. If you wanted to make a game that was hard, you could have made something that would shoot them, or made spikes that shoot out. Instead, like an unfair Mario or unfair cat Mario and all that stuff, it's this weird feeling of assets ripped from a different game. But obviously, this is the game. So I think there should be a real appreciation here for the care Scott Cawthon took in recreating each of these styles of games. And I quickly just want to touch on the new area, the Halloween Backstage. I honestly wonder if this was originally planned to be a Halloween update and then it had to take a turn, or if this was all planned from the beginning. Either way, the new backstage area reminds me a lot of FNAF 4. Not just because of FNAF 4's Halloween update, but also the use of spooky houses, trees, and the color red and orange. I think it's done this way almost to remind you that yes, FNAF is still a horror series, even if this game isn't. Okay, let's get the big thing out of the way. Voice acting, fully voiced characters that aren't Scott Cawthon. Let's go into a little more detail here. For a few of the minigames, they are fully voiced with all of the characters. That, and also, 
the end. But what's really interesting about things like Foxy Fighters is the names here are actually pretty impressive. For instance, JJ, Toy Chica, and Nightmare Chica are voiced by Amber Lee Connor, who's done voices for Borderlands 3, My Hero Academia, and a Final Fantasy game. Foxy is voiced by Jesse Adams, who's been in Marvel's Avengers Academy, and other characters like Soldozer and Fredbear were voiced by people who would become staples of FNAF from here on out. PJ Haywood and Christopher McCall- McC 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 The introduction of fully voiced characters is very important to the series as we go on, but for now let's just talk about it in the context of this game. In Chica's Magic Rainbow, the rainbow itself mocks you whenever you die, including what I think may be the first instance of like an actual swear word in a FNAF game. Damn it. Oh, and um... Don't try to turn off the voice. Oh, really? It's like that. Voice is off, you say? Well, now you've really pissed me off! Now, obviously, this adds a lot to the rage of the game, specifically the high-pitched, overly happy sound. But guess who voiced the rainbow? Jimmy fucking Neutron. I'm not joking. Jimmy Neutron's voice, Debbie Derryberry. Is that her name? That is an insane name. She was also in Toy Story. What I'm trying to point out is they have star power here. Speaking of star power, guess who did the voice lines in the background of Foxy.exe? Mark Martell, AKA the guy who did Freddie Mercury's singing in the Queen movie. The point is this is a star studded cast. And of course we couldn't talk about voices without talking about Toy Chica's little debacle. I'll just play it. You won't get tired. Oh, and speaking of annoying, the Foxy.exe voice lines just play over and over and over and over with no breaks. This game is really good at annoying the shit out of you on purpose. Before we move on, I want to talk about the music. Not just for Update 2, but for the game in general. My last video, I didn't really talk about it that much, but I think the person who composed it deserves some credit. Leon Riskin. There are actually some tracks that I remember being available that didn't make it into the game, but were on the FNAF World website. The music is all catchy, memorable, it's just really good, and I think the creator deserves some credit. Moving on. Okay, the plot. Now there isn't a bunch of different endings or some clock ending that ties into the main lore somehow, but there is something important here. Like I said, when you first enter the game to activate the Update 2 content, you're led into this pixelated cutscene. Here, a mysterious man sits at a desk, known as the Desk Man, seemingly working on something. Here's what he says. It's a vicious cycle, you know, but then most things in life are. The pendulum swings one way, then it swings the other. Now we return to darkness. Something terrible is coming. Come back later. Maybe I will tell you more. From here, all you can do is leave. At this point, you can then talk to Fredbear again. He starts out like he's about to send you on some big adventure, but the music cuts out and, well, Fredbear seems awfully disappointed. He tells you that the game bombed in reference to the poor reception of the game's release, and now he has gone insane. No one knows what he's making and they can't get to it. It's best to just leave the game alone. However, after a lot of dot dot dots, you convince him to help you along. He lets you into a portal that leads you to the Halloween backstage area, where unreleased characters are. They're the only thing strong enough to defeat the Guardian that's protecting this thing that he is making. Here is where you salvage the code of the characters by completing the minigames their code was used for. The area that leads to the Guardian is filled with toxic air, meaning you'll need a full party of these new characters to move on. Many of the minigames themselves have plots inside of them, like Freddy in Space is sort of a meta-commentary on Scott Cawthon making a bunch of games and crazy spin-offs. There's plenty of inside jokes and references, and even a reference to, I think, what might be the first time we ever heard anything about the FNAF movie script, although I guess we didn't know that's what it was at the time. A reference to the Plushies Take Manhattan rejected script that I think happened early on in the FNAF movie development. Generally, like the first update of FNAF World, all the dialogue is very meta and jokey. After collecting all the characters and leveling them up, you enter the final toxic geist area. The Geist Lair is filled with pixelated and extremely difficult enemies. Navigating this area leads you to the final boss, the Purple Geist. He pops on screen and... The rainbow from Chica's Magic Rainbow squashes him, 
That's right, the final boss is Chica's Magic Rainbow. Very fitting considering that minigame is regarded as the hardest one. Not only do you need to beat this boss, but you need to do it in 3 minutes or else you lose automatically. Doing so leads to a quick death cutscene. The next time you see a rainbow in the sky, that is me coming to your house! And then, we're back to the desk man. I'm impressed. What are you doing here? Can't you see I'm busy? You deactivated my games. I didn't know what else to do. I don't want to disappoint people, but my mind isn't right. I've made something terrible. Her name is Baby. It's too late to deactivate her. I'm sorry. The lights go out and... The show will begin momentarily. Everyone, please stay in your seats. Then, the lights cut back on and blood spills out around the desk man's head. Fade to black. To be continued. The end. Obviously, there is a lot to talk about here after that, and we know generally that this was a teaser for a sister location, but more theories we'll get into later. For now, I just want to talk about a couple miscellaneous things. First off, there's a secret path that lets you get into the backstage area without ever talking to the desk man, as Purple Guy tells you. Generally, this update was received a lot better than the first update. It added a lot of content, it was funny, and it was generally more polished. Plus, like I said, it broke new ground for the series. A whole cast of voiced characters, a teaser for the next game inside the game, and plenty of meta commentary. I also remember Daco having to play this game in the hospital and just personally being very worried about him. Also, weirdly enough, there have been plenty of fan games based off of FNAF World, although not nearly as many as the main series games. People also drew comparisons to uh, Five Nights at Fuckboys, which was a game that was released a little bit before FNAF World initially was. Also, with the increased difficulty of the minigames, a whole mini community built around speedruns. Chica's Magic Rainbow world record, as far as I know, is 59.22 seconds. Whenever Scott presents a challenge, people always find a way to take it upon themselves to make a harder one and then beat it. Oh! Alright, the theories for this were pretty straightforward actually. There was a couple different ways to look at it, but the main one was that Desk Man was Scott Cawthon himself, talking about this new game that he was creating. <laughs> With the hard mode ending and a lot of the meta talk, it made the most sense. There were other ideas though, mainly that Desk Man was Henry. For those who don't know, in the Silver Eyes, a FNAF novel released not long before FNAF World, there's a character named Henry who created the animatronics and then kills himself. It's never exactly clear why, so people thought that that's what this end cutscene was, and he did it because he created this new character, Baby. When it came to who the Baby character was, we'd find out pretty soon. Alright, let's get straight to the point. Although this update was received a lot better than the initial game at release, it was also a lot shorter. There was interesting content, but not a lot of it, and there weren't multiple endings. In the end, it was more of a glorified teaser for the next game. It was fun and great for the community at the time, but I'm gonna have to put it in C tier with the original game. So, FNAF World Update 2. Great for the time and still fun to go back and play through, but gameplay-wise and story-wise, it was a little short. Either way, it was a fantastic interlude for the next game, Sister Location. Alright, before we move on, I just want to quickly shout out my second channel. Again, I did it in the last video. It just has some random side projects and more funny stuff. If you're just here for the retrospectives, I would say don't bother subscribing over there. But if you're just interested in random content that I happen to make on the side, then go check it out. Alright, so. The Sister Location teasers were interesting. Even the fans getting ahead of Scott at one point. So we'll have to talk about that in the next video. See you all next time.